shipping. Some love it, some hate it, but you can't have a fandom without it. And the more characters a franchise has, the more potential ships there are. This is absolutely the case for Sonic the Hedgehog, a franchise with a lot of ships. And I want to know why people like the ships they like. So from the mainstream to the obscure, we're going to be discussing a variety of Sonic ships and try and understand why they exist with the help of a Google form I posted on Tumblr. Let's get started. Starting off, we have probably the most well-known Sonic ship out there, aside from another extremely obvious one that we will get to later, Sonic and Amy, also known as Son Amy. Often seen as the standard male-female ship in the Sonic franchise, Son Amy has an interesting legacy among Sonic fans to say the least. From the moment of her creation, Amy's identity was heavily tied to her prolific crush on Sonic. Originally planned to be the mini to Sonic's Mickey, it was eventually decided that a girlfriend did not fit with Sonic's personality, so the dynamic was changed to the one that first appeared in Sonic CD. Yeah, so, but Sonic is the kind of kind of guy who can't he can't he's too fidgety, he can't stay in one place. So as, as a girlfriend, there's no way he could like really lock himself into a, a relationship like that. That would be kind of sort of not really Sonic like. So like a kind of your standard cartoon couples like Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, like that sort of pattern for characters would be so as a result, um, you know, Amy ended up, she's all into Sonic, that's what her mind is, but Sonic, he's always going from one adventure, from one big disaster to the next, and trying to do that, constantly moving forward, so as a result, that's why we have that sort of, uh, this sort of, one-way relationship going on between them. So, hold on, what's going on one-way? Isn't that more interesting? What do you guys think? Is that interesting? Amy spent most of her life as a character in the franchise being known as the girl obsessed with Sonic, despite being a key character in the series. This was not helped by some games, notably Sonic Heroes, betraying Amy's crush to such a cartoonish degree that it still affects how people view Amy in the fandom. Of course, Amy's character has evolved immensely, and modern Son Amy content absolutely reflects this. I think it is important to acknowledge that as the fandom evolves, many of the fan and characterizations have as well. Amy is absolutely a much more respected character nowadays in comparison to the 2000s Sonic fandom. And I think Amy's character evolution has aided in this. From the games to the spin-off material, I think the best way to describe it is that Amy went from being portrayed as obsessed with Sonic to having a lot of admiration and respect for Sonic. I think it is also worth noting that modern Son Amy adapts the idea of Sonic's personality not fitting a relationship and finds a way to make the chemistry work within that context. Many fans portray Sonic, in many ships, not just Son Amy, as being someone who doesn't really get romance but goes about it his own way. And in the modern context of Son Amy, many fans have latched onto the idea that Sonic does reciprocate but does not show it in a conventional manner. And in response, Amy accepts it because she respects who he is. Amy simply cares about and loves Sonic. I should reiterate that this kind of genuine character analysis is a far cry from the way Son Amy was treated in the 2000s or even the 2010s. A lot of Amy-related content was mean-spirited jabs at Amy as a character, but seeing as her crush on Sonic will always be in some way part of her character legacy, I think it is nice to see more thoughtful analysis of Amy because she is more than just a Sonic fangirl. So at the end of the day, why do people like Son Amy? It's quite simple really. People find their dynamic cute when portrayed the right way. You have someone who is extremely emotional paired with someone who simply isn't. But at the end of the day, they still care about each other deeply. Son Amy is a cornerstone of Sonic shipping, and that will never go away. But regardless, Son Amy is more than just a standard male-female ship. Next up, we have Knuckles and Rouge, also known as Nuxuge, another one of the cornerstone Sonic ships. This is arguably another one of the most recognizable ships. However, this ship is definitely more complicated than Son Amy. While Son Amy is more of a wholesome mutual friendship, Nuxuge is more of a rivals to lovers dynamic. Knuckles and Rouge serve as foils to each other in many different ways. You have a suave jewel thief paired with a hot-headed and stubborn guardian of a large, powerful gem. A large part of their early dynamic revolved around Rouge's desire to steal the Master Emerald, which made her an antagonistic presence for Knuckles. Their relationship has definitely become friendlier over time, but Rouge's desire for the Master Emerald never truly left. Rouge is also quite a flirtatious character, while Knuckles struggles to understand that kind of thing, 
as he is easily flustered by her remarks. Because of this, Naxuj is definitely more of a comedic ship than Sanemi, which is absolutely part of its charm. It is extremely common to see comedic pieces of Naxuj fan art. However, I think there is another element to the ship that's more subtle but adds to its appeal. Knuckles' loneliness. We don't have time to go into detail about how genuinely sad Knuckles' upbringing was, being isolated on an island until Sonic 3, but I think that origin story adds to the desire that many fans have to see him happy, and in fandom, it is quite common for this desire to result in shipping. Keep this mentality in mind for later. In the case of Knuckles, it makes sense why Rouge is the character he is most commonly shipped with in this case. Because of the way their personalities connect, I think people like seeing the softer sides of these characters become more visible as a result of each other. It is clear that Rouge is genuinely interested in Knuckles as a person and not just the Master Emerald, and because Knuckles' relationship with Rouge is undoubtedly romantic-coded, it makes sense that many fans are interested in the ship and its potential. So why do people like Nux Rouge? Well, simply put, people like it for its comedic potential primarily, but also because canon has shown that they do ultimately care for each other despite their rivalry. Their personalities complement each other and they are just fun to see together. Probably the most universally enjoyed ship in the Sonic fandom, Whisper and Tangle, also known as Wispangle, is one of the newer ships in the fandom, but undoubtedly a popular one. There is a lot I can say about this ship, I cannot reiterate enough how beloved this ship is. Both Whisper and Tangle are characters who originate from the IDW comics, and it did not take long for people to conclude that they were gay as hell. For starters, they have a very Sun X Moon extrovert X introvert dynamic, which is already very popular, but as the comics went on, this ship became something bigger than that. This was especially aided by the Tangle and Whisper miniseries, which is when Tangle and Whisper started to be portrayed as extremely close friends. This is also when Whisper's backstory and trauma is explored. This will be important later. So everything was great for us Wispangle fans, and then the Metal Virus happened. For those who don't know, this was essentially a robot zombie apocalypse arc, which featured many of the characters getting infected and turned into zombots. Uh, spoilers for this arc, but basically one of those characters is Tangle, and this completely devastates Whisper, so much so that she almost shoots Eggman. Eggman would be dead were it not for Cream. Now, this connects back to Whisper's backstory. Whisper's team was betrayed and killed, and she was the only one who escaped this portrayal. This resulted in Whisper struggling to open up to others, and even in the current arc, it is shown that she's still struggling to accept friendship again. But then she opened up with Tangle. She made a new friend after tragically losing her old ones. Tangle was able to help her begin to heal from that betrayal. And of course, the healing was an instant, but Tangle has proven to be patient in the areas that truly count. Tangle and Whisper truly work together so well. They care about each other deeply, and it has been shown that their dynamic is undoubtedly something special. I don't think I'm breaking any new grounds here by saying that their dynamic is so special and goes beyond a close friendship. It is also worth noting that the writers and the artists of the IDW comics support this ship, and Ian Flynn has even hinted that it might be canon were it not for Sega's mandates. Uh, Adam took it a little further than was in the script. That's fine. <laughs> you know, read the room, play it to the audience. Uh, right now, Sega's official word is we're not to really go in depth with any romantic relationships so they're just really 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 the bestest of friends uh -huh. <laughs> which i'm just kind of gonna smile nod wink nudge yes they're they're, they're great friends. Uh-huh. Dry cough. Oh, man. So, depending on if the mandates loosen up any time in the future, it's entirely possible that this could become canon at some point, which I think I can confidently say would be a great thing to see. To wrap up this segment, Wispangle is quite easy to see the appeal of. On the surface, it appears to be a standard extrovert and introvert pairing, but once you look deeper, the subtle depths of these characters become more evident, and it's undeniable that these two care about each other deeply. They've had their rough patches, but they've managed to make it work, and quite frankly, I am excited to see how their <clears throat> friendship evolves in the future. Though not really a mainstream ship anymore, Sonic and Sally, also known as Son Alley, was once absolutely a major ship in the Sonic fandom, and at one point in time, it was official. This ship spawned as a result of the combined forces of the Sonic Sad I Am cartoon and the Archie comics. In both of these properties, the relationship between Sonic and Sally is a major factor. To many people, their personalities complement each other well. Their dynamic is very much a brain and brawn type of dynamic, with Sally being the brains and Sonic being the brawn. 
They both help each other out and they both serve as important members of the Freedom Fighters, and many fans are fond of the way these two work together. Now, similar to San Amy, because of how long Sally as a character has existed, things have definitely been inconsistent to say the least. This is mainly the case of the Archie comics, which are a rabbit hole. Look, we don't have time to fully dive into the writing of the romance arcs in Archie, but simply put, it's quite a lot. But we're here to discuss why people like this ship, and when it's written well, these two are quite an enjoyable duo. Their relationship isn't perfect, and they have their differing views, but they still manage to make their relationship work out in the long run. They both have extremely strong personalities, and it is extremely fun to see those personalities bounce off of each other. Similar to San Amy, most San Ali fans focus on the better aspects of the relationship rather than the weaker stories, which is one of the fun parts of fanon. You could just ignore the stuff in canon that isn't good! It's also worth noting that many fans of the ship are childhood fans, meaning they consumed either the Sat AM cartoon or the Archie comics or both, and have been fans of the ship since they were kids, and this is not a bad thing, in fact I find it interesting. I am honestly happy that people are still keeping the character of Sally alive, given that her status as a character is currently in limbo. Sally has had a complex legacy, but I'm happy that Son Alley fans have been making sure she still has a legacy. Because Sally truly is a good character. She's smart, she's brave, she ultimately works well with Sonic despite how often she bickers with him because of his antics. Whether platonic or romantic, these two are a great duo. In conclusion, while Son Alley has had his ups and downs, when written well, the two are quite the outstanding pair. Sally serves as a wonderful level-headed foil to Sonic's impulsiveness, and even when they bicker, it is still obvious that they have a special dynamic. And hopefully Sally as a character won't be locked away in the void forever. Our first major rare pair, Espio and Silver, also known as Espilver, is quite an interesting ship. Espio and Silver first primarily interacted in Sonic Rivals 2, which is where the ship originated from. They grew to become close friends over the course of the game, and then did not have any other major interactions until the 2022 IDW Annual. So, from the sound of things, some of you may be thinking, why is this a ship if they don't interact much? Well, that's the fun of rare pairs. There may be less official material in comparison to, say, Wispangle or San Amy, but that gives fans more room for headcanons. Headcanons are a major appeal of fanon, especially in ships. A rare pair may have less chances of becoming canon, but fanon has more room for speculation and creativity. So let's apply that mentality to Espilver to try and understand why people like this ship. Both Silver and Espio are very dutiful characters who have a strong sense of justice. They both care deeply about stopping villainy and doing what is right. However, as shown in the IDW Annual, they both struggle with a feeling of paranoia regarding lingering danger. Espio is the one Silver confides in as he's anxious over the state of the future, but Espio reassured him that he isn't alone. This one comic story showcases a wonderful bond and sense of trust between the two, even though they interact very infrequently. And with headcanon, there's a lot of room for your own interpretations and speculations for what their dynamic and interactions would be like. For example, there are a lot of headcanons regarding how Vector and Charmy would react to Espio getting a partner. There's also the previous mentioned theme of people often default to shipping when they want to see a character happy, and that absolutely applies here. Espio is a very underrated character, and Silver has been through... a lot? I think they both deserve to be happy. I'm not even going to try and hide it. I think making this video made me appreciate the ship a lot more. These two characters work really well together and they share a deep sense of trust. Just please, Sega, let them interact more. They are a great duo. Another ship with some canon compliance, Tails and Cosmo, also known as Tailsmo, is a ship that spawned as a result of Sonic X Season 3. Cosmo is a character that originates from Sonic X, an alien girl who very quickly forms a close friendship with Tails. Over the course of Season 3, the two grow increasingly closer and eventually fall in love with each other. Tails even attempts to fight off Shadow to protect Cosmo, however their relationship ultimately ends in tragedy, as Cosmo sacrifices herself to save the world and Tails is the one who has to kill her. All that is left to Cosmo is a seed that is shown to be planted, and neither she or any member of her species is seen again, so it's left ambiguous as if the seed actually did something. Now, a major factor of the ship is its canon angst material, as that is what most people remember it for. Because of everything Cosmo went through over the course of the Metarex saga and her ultimate fate, there's an element of tragedy in this relationship. Because of this, many fans are interested in what this relationship could have been rather than what it actually was. Arguably, Tailsmo is another ship that is elevated more from the fanon than the actual text of canon. The angst and tragedy of the finale is what most people remember from canon, but the actual relationship gets kind of lost in the discussion. While the ship is technically canon compliant, there's not a lot of actual canon material. 
And similar to Sally, Cosmo's character legacy is very much tied to the ship. However, arguably Cosmo's legacy is much more tied to her relationship with Tails in comparison to Sally's relationship with Sonic due to Cosmo having a much shorter character legacy. So many fans are interested in what the relationship between Cosmo and Tails could have been. However, many people still like the ship a lot and not just because of angst. A lot of Sonic X Season 3 is dedicated to the two of them and they are ultimately a very cute duo despite not having much depth. The actual relationship isn't really that complex, but it's sweet and sometimes that's all a ship needs to be. Tails and Cosmo as an actual ship is kind of generic, but it's still very wholesome despite the tragedy that surrounds it. The fanon largely exists to give the two further development and depth, and unfortunately it is unlikely that Cosmo will return, but that's why we have fanon to imagine a happier ending for her. Another major rare pair, we have Blaze and Amy, also known as Blaze Amy. These two first interacted in Sonic Rush, Blaze's debut game, and here they became good friends. However, because of Blaze's separation from the rest of the cast, being from another dimension, they interact very infrequently, with most of their primary interactions being in things like the Olympic Games or the comics. Now, a large part of the appeal of the ship is an element that is very similar to Son Amy, and that's that Amy is a very emotional person while Blaze simply isn't. Blaze goes out of her way to conceal her emotions, while Amy always lets her true feelings shine through. This makes sense given that Blaze is meant to be a parallel of Sonic, and in their interactions, Amy is shown to help Blaze accept acceptance from others and open up more. As such, even though they interact very infrequently, they have a special bond. The two of them are also notably very strong fighters, and I noticed that people like seeing two badasses together in a ship. Now, there's also the fact that Blaze is a princess while Amy is an ordinary person. I notice in a lot of fandoms that people like ships where someone of some kind of higher status, in this case royalty, falls for someone who's more average. For example, you can argue that this is part of the appeal of Marich and Luezi from the Mario fandom, and I think that same mentality applies with Blaze and Amy. There's also a very simple reason as to why people like this ship. It's cute. And like Tailsmo, sometimes that's all a ship needs to be is a cute hypothetical. The two are also already close friends, so a romantic relationship is not much of a leap. To put it simply, this ship is a very cute friends-to-lovers dynamic between two characters who honestly work well together. I would love it if Sega showcased their friendship more because whether or not you ship it, you gotta admit, it is an underrated dynamic. A newer rare pair featuring characters who have never interacted in canon, yet. Surge and Amy, also known as Surge Amy, is quite the unique ship. Surge the Tenrec is a character who originates from the IDW comics and her backstory is... certainly something. We do not have time to go into detail about all the stuff that Surge experienced in the comics, but to put it simply, she has been through a lot. Now, remember when I said that many people default to shipping when they want a character to be happy? Well, this absolutely applies to Surge in pretty much all of her ships, but Sir Jamie is the most popular Surge ship, at least so far, so it's the one we're discussing first. I feel like this element keeps appearing in all of Amy's ships, but I think part of why Amy is the main character Surge is shipped with is because of her genuinely caring and loving personality. There is also the fact that there is comedic value in Amy falling for one of Sonic's rivals who genuinely hates him, but I think this ship makes more sense beyond that. Because the fate of Surge is currently unknown and because of a recent tweet that Ian Flynn made, there is a possibility of these two actually meeting, and because Surge's drama with Sonic was never truly resolved, many people like to imagine another character being able to help Surge. So it makes sense that people like to imagine get Surge getting help from and ultimately falling for someone so genuinely nice and loving. There is also the fact that given Surge's complex dynamic with Sonic and her relationship with her identity, I can see why people like to pair her up with Amy. It would be a little ironic, but it does make sense to me. Amy is the kind of person who loves someone for who they are, not who they could be, and as shown in an earlier issue of IDW, which I think it could greatly benefit Surge, a character who struggles with her identity. And similar to Blaze Amy, people also like them because they're both badass girls and they have bonus points for contrasting aesthetics, with Amy being more sweet and feminine and Surge being more punk. So ultimately, despite never interacting, there's a lot of reasonable ground to ship these two, and hopefully with the tweet that Ian Flynn made, this, this means that there are plans to continue the story of Surge in the future, and maybe then we'll get to see how she and Amy would interact. Another rare pair, we have Sonic and Blaze, also known as Sonnets. Sonic and Blaze are already meant to parallel each other as previously stated, and they are shown to be close friends who have a strong sense of trust for one another, but the ways in which they parallel each other is quite interesting. 
Blaze is someone burdened by her responsibilities both as a princess and as the guardian of the Soul Emeralds. Meanwhile, Sonic is so much more carefree, not caring what others think about him and answering to no one. However, he's still sort of obligated to be the hero of his world, but more so out of his own choice. With Blaze, it's because of her status as royalty. Sonic, however, knows fully well he can't do everything alone, while Blaze believes she had to do everything alone until meeting Sonic and his friends. They both are also associated with a specific element, Sonic being the wind and Blaze being the fire. To many people, these parallels serve to create an interesting dynamic. It's not entirely an opposites attract situation, but more so a case of interesting thematic foils, which I'll admit is something I am very fond of in Chips. So I can see why people would be interested in someone who is so different yet also so similar to Sonic being paired with him. Despite their differences, they both act as protectors of their respective worlds and care deeply about those they are close to. However, there is also an element of tragedy in pretty much all of Blaze's ships, but especially in this one. And that's the fact that Blaze is frequently separated from the rest of the cast as a result of living in another dimension. They cannot interact much as a result, leading to a large potential for angst. In regards to Sonic specifically, there is also the fact that Blaze is a princess, and Sonic's personality and lifestyle doesn't really work with the monarchy. This issue also appeared in Son Alley, and it's likely it would appear in Son A's. These factors give Son A's potential for angst in a way that not a lot of other Sonic ships do. To put it simply, Son A's is a ship between two characters who can be so extensively compared and contrasted in a very unique way. For various reasons, it's kind of hard to say if the ship would work out, but if they did make it work, it would be quite the power couple. A ship that has some canon compliance, Sally and Nicole, also known as Salicole, is interesting to talk about. Nicole is an artificial intelligence that resided in Sally's handheld computer. She technically existed in the Sad AM cartoon as a simple computer, but in the Archie comics, Nicole is given a physical form. And throughout the comics, Sally and Nicole grow to be increasingly close friends. While Nicole is seen as a valuable member of the Freedom Fighters as a whole, she is undoubtedly closest with Sally. The ship is specifically interesting because of Nicole's nature as an artificial intelligence. People who enjoy the ship like the idea of Sally helping Nicole learn about and adjust to emotions. In the comics, Nicole increasingly becomes more emotional and expressive, and Sally is arguably an important factor in that development. There is also the potential for angst with Nicole technically not being real. Nicole being an artificial intelligence is an integral part of her character and her understanding of emotions, so it makes sense for fans to want to explore her relationship with her humanity. Or her... Mobian Nindy? Either way, despite this element of Nicole, Sally un ultimately sees Nicole as a real person and a close friend. Despite Nicole not being used to emotions initially being fueled by logic only, it's clear that she cares deeply about Sally and that the feelings are mutual. The relationship only grows stronger as the comics go on. The two work really well together, both being incredibly smart characters who also care deeply about their world and want to protect it no matter what, but they also wish to protect each other no matter what. It is also worth noting that the writers were intentionally adding romantic hints for these two. Aaliyah Baker and Ian Flynn have stated on Twitter that they were adding romantic hints into the comics regarding these two being a couple. So the ship is technically canon compliant. This ship is pretty easy to see the appeal of. These two share a special bond that is very unique to them. The ship is a very cute friends to lovers type of dynamic, and unfortunately though we may not have gotten a full development due to the cancellation of Archie, at least we have Fanon. Hopefully they come back someday. Agent Stone and Dr. Robotnik, also known as Stobotnik, is a fascinating ship to say the least. Agent Stone is a character original to the Paramount Sonic movies, and in the first film many people came to the conclusion that his dynamic with Robotnik was romantically coded. And to be honest, I am completely convinced that Paramount saw this fan response and doubled down, because there are a lot of moments in the second Sonic movie that feel as though they only make sense if Stone was attracted to Robotnik. And many fans quickly latched onto Stone, not just because of the ship, but also because of his actual character. And the dynamic between this version of Robotnik and Stone elevates each other's characters in subtle ways. Agent Stone is more than just an ordinary comic relief henchman. He cares about Robotnik deeply and is shown to be extremely affected when Robotnik disappears at the end of the first movie. But in an interesting subversion, I'd argue that Robotnik cares about Stone too. Robotnik didn't have to take Stone with him when he was powered by the Master Emerald. And yet he did, and I find that fascinating. A major appeal of the ship is one that exists in a lot of fandoms, the enjoyment of seeing evil villains who do crime together and love it. Stone is just as invested in the villainy as Robotnik is as seen in the second movie, and if there's one thing better than villains to a fandom, it's gay villains. The ship also has a lot of comedic value, with Stone's coffee being a running gag in both movies, and also being the center of probably one of the gayest scenes in both movies. Said scene was also used in an ad literally posted on Valentine's Day. I'm telling you, I'm telling you guys, Paramount knows! 
So ultimately, it's quite easy to see why Stobotnik got so popular. On the surface, it appears to be a simple comedic evil gay villain duo, but the subtext between it is quite fascinating, and frankly, I am excited to see what direction the third movie takes stone. A ship that I recently learned about, Metal Sonic and Amy, also known as Met Amy, seems to be getting a lot more attention lately. Both Amy and Metal Sonic originate from Sonic CD in which Metal Sonic captured Amy. However, the ship seems to have gained popularity recently because of the Sonic Mania short focusing on both of these characters. In this short, Eggman abandons Metal Sonic and Amy brings Metal back to Eggman. The short showed Amy expressing some sympathy for Metal despite Metal being so loyal to Eggman. And one could argue this sympathy is because Metal is so loyal to Eggman since that loyalty is programmed into Metal Sonic. Again, seeing this element of Amy's loving personality appearing in all her shifts, but this also explains Met Amy. My understanding of the ship is that many fans see Amy as someone who can help Metal explore his identity outside of his loyalty to Eggman. And similar to Sir Jamie, Metal has identity issues regarding his similarities with Sonic, so there is also an irony factor there as well. However, Metal Sonic technically doesn't have emotions outside the emotions he was programmed with, so in regards to a hypothetical relationship, I can see the appeal of the idea that he learns more about emotions from another person, again, seeing the reoccurring theme of people shipping characters they want to be happy. And who better to teach Metal Sonic about emotions than arguably the most emotional and loving character in the franchise? To quote one of the responses on the form, Neo Metal is the Megamind to Amy's Roxanne. <laughs> Metal as a character is also one who has a lot of potential for angst, and from what I've seen, angst is pretty common with Met Amy fans. Metal Sonic struggles with his identity, never being able to defeat Sonic, plus his desire to make Eggman happy. All of this is a perfect recipe for angst. That angst, combined with the aforementioned compassion from Amy, creates a pretty interesting ship. So ultimately, I can pretty easily see the appeal of the ship. It can be both wholesome and angsty, which is always fun to work with in ships. These two are certainly an interesting pair. Arguably the most popular ship to include these characters, Infinite and Gadget, aka the player character in Forces, also known as Infidget, is a ship with varying interpretations. Gadget is the name the fandom gave to the player character in Sonic Forces, and because of this, Gadget does not really have a set personality. Yet, as per the rule of fandoms, of course they're going to be shipped. And fandoms undoubtedly love their enemies to lovers, so it makes sense to me that the ship is the most popular for both of them. This is another ship more elevated by fandom than canon. Because Gadget doesn't have a defined personality, the potential for headcanons is essentially endless. There is also the fact that many people are not fond of Infinite's canon backstory and character, thus often using fanon to rewrite him. Sonic Forces is already frequently rewritten in the fandom, so it makes sense that Infinite is as well. So because fanon heavily dictates the, the perception of these two characters, the relationship essentially has no canon compliance despite it being a case where these characters did interact. Every fan has their own unique version of the ship as a result of this, so a lot of the Infinite content I've seen revolves around alternate universes or AUs, as well as Sonic Forces fix-its. Because of this ship's nature, being one where it's entirely fan-centric, there is a lot of creativity in the way people portray the enemies to lovers dynamic. So why do people like Infinite? Simply put, it's an interesting case study for the tendency for headcanons and canon divergence to take over fandoms, or in this case the fanon content regarding one game. People have essentially taken Infinite and Gadget and run wild. Sonic and Knuckles, also known as Son Nux, and sometimes Son Knuckles, is a ship I'm surprised is not more popular. Knuckles initially started out as an antagonistic presence for Sonic, due to a misunderstanding, but after that the two have become very close friends with a bit of a rivalry. Knuckles is on the more friendly end of the spectrum of Sonic's rivals, but said rivalry is still somewhat there. However, despite being a rivals to lovers type of dynamic, I would say the ship has a lot of similarities to Sonic's. Similar to Blaze, Knuckles is someone burdened with his responsibilities to protect an important gem, while Sonic does whatever he wants. The two are thematic foils in many different ways, the way they have a sun and moon dynamic, the aforementioned freedom versus responsibility, the speed versus the strength, and they're also a red and blue duo, which, if you know anything about gay characters in fandoms, red and blue duos are very iconic. There is also the previously mentioned element of Knuckles' loneliness. Sonic is arguably a major factor in Knuckles meeting more people and seeing the world beyond Angel Island. Sonic and Knuckles have gone on so many adventures together that a romantic relationship feels reasonable. Knuckles is one of Sonic's most trusted friends after all. The ship is fun because it's simultaneously a friends to lovers dynamic and a rivals to lovers dynamic. So there is ultimately a lot of ground to ship these two. I'm assuming the only reason the ship isn't more popular is because of the ex existence of ships like Sonato and Nuxuge being more prominent. But Sonux is definitely underappreciated. Also, what was up with those cutscenes in Frontiers? 
Silver and Blaze, also known as Sylvaze, was once an extremely popular ship in the fandom, to an inescapable degree. However, nowadays the ship has kind of died. That's not to say that no one ships them anymore, people absolutely do, and you can still find content for them if you search. However, as I previously stated, they were once inescapable, and that is no longer the case. You have to understand that I've been in the Sonic fandom for a long time. I have been in this fandom since I was a very young child. So why exactly is this the case? Well, I believe there are two main reasons. The first is the fact that in the modern fandom, many fans have shifted to viewing this duo in a platonic sense. Second, there are a lot more ships that involve these characters that have become popular over the years. For Silver and Blaze, these two have a lot of rare pairs that people ship involving them like Espilver, Sonnets, Blaze Amy, etc. As for the actual ship, my understanding of the ship is just because this duo is very close and often associated. They worked well together in 06, so people naturally ship them. There is also the angst factor of both Blaze's sacrifice in 06 and the separation of the two characters' face, one being from another dimension and the other being from the future. I feel like this is a similar case to Tailsmo, where a popular ship then involves some kind of sacrifice, not really having much depth, but still being a cute ship. Plus, again, people like to ship characters that they want to be happy, and both Silver and Blaze deserve to be happy. I guess these two serve as an interesting case study for varying fandom interpretations, but no matter how you see them, platonic or romantic, you gotta admit Silver and Blaze are a fun duo. A more comedic ship, Sonic and Jet, also known as San Jet, is more of a fun rivalry ship. Jet the Hawk is Sonic's main rival in the Sonic Riders games, however Jet is a more petty rival. The best way I can describe Jet as a character is as a wonderful bastard. He is very temperamental, prideful, and competitive, however sharing many similar traits with Sonic, essentially being a more conceited version of Sonic. Many people have interpreted Jet's rivalry with Sonic into a headcanon that Sonic and Jet are exes. This headcanon is extremely popular and a huge source of comedy in the San Jet fanbase. Their friendly but still somewhat competitive rivalry gives San Jet more potential for humor than most other Sonic ships. This is undoubtedly the main appeal of the ship. Fandoms love stupid gay idiots and that energy absolutely carries the San Jet following. But they also both somewhat complement each other. They're both full of charisma and a little full of themselves, but in different ways. They're both competitive and they have a lot of playful banter. They are also both extremely fast and love to race. Despite their rivalry and the commonly made assumption that Jet hates Sonic, they do have some respect for one another. They play off each other in a really fun way and are very fun to watch. Unlike ships like Son Nux or Son A's, Jet isn't really a parallel or foil to Sonic, rather he's just subtly similar to Sonic. The difference gives San Jet a different vibe from other Sonic ships. Rather than someone who is subtly similar and different to Sonic being paired with him, it's someone who reflects many of Sonic's subtler traits being paired with him. So why do people like San Jet? Aside from the aforementioned comedic potential and fun memes, the ship serves as an interesting subversion of most of Sonic's rivals to lover ships by having Sonic be paired with someone who doesn't parallel him but complements him. Hopefully someday we'll get more of Jet the Hawk in the games. A canon compliant ship from the Archie comics, Bunny and Antoine, also known as Buntuan, is pretty cute. Bunny and Antoine also appear in the Sad AM cartoon, however their relationship doesn't develop the same way it does in the Archie comics. In the cartoon, Antoine spends most of his screen time pining after Sally, however in the Archie comics the two become a couple. In fact, they actually end up getting married with their marriage being shown in the comics. Technically, Antoine proposes twice because of the timeline shenanigans caused by the continuity reset, but we don't have time to talk about that. So since this is one of the few Sonic ships that is canon compliant blatantly, what can we say about the actual relationship? Well, it's quite simple. The ship is super wholesome. And that is absolutely its main appeal. The two are simply adorable to see together, and they undoubtedly love each other deeply. These two also embody one of my favorite ship dynamics, a badass girl and a guy who's a little lovingly cringe fail. Bunny is shown to help Antoine grow when she loves him despite his faults, and Antoine develops as a character because of her. They are probably the ultimate girl boss and male wife duo in the entire Sonic franchise. Their dynamic is super fun and wonderful to see together. So ultimately, this ship makes a lot of sense, and not just because it's canon compliant. It's a very wholesome ship between two characters who simply love each other deeply. God, I miss them. Vector and Vanilla, also known as Vectilla, is a pretty interesting ship. The two have never interacted in any of the games, but Sonic X establishes the idea that Vector is attracted to Vanilla, Cream's mom. He is shown to go to great miles to impress her and win her affections. Though it is not exactly clear how Vanilla feels about Vector, although Vector is not exactly the most subtle character, so I think it's safe to say that she knows he likes her. <laughs> Sonic X is pretty much where the ship spawned from, and though the following for it is small, it is a dedicated following. 
There are already a lot of headcanons that feature Vector being like a dad to Espio and Charmy, headcanons that I happen to subscribe to, so this ship essentially adds cream into the mix. This ship also gets bonus points for the contrasting personalities of Vector and Vanilla. Vector is loud and short-tempered, while Vanilla is calm and composed. There is not really much to say about this ship other than the fact that it's sweet. This ship is another one where there is not a lot of depth, but it is a cute hypothetical. With how many characters exist in the franchise, it is of course going to result in an absurd amount of rare pairs. I cannot discuss in depth every single rare pair that exists, so to compromise, here is a rare pair lightning round featuring a few of the rare pairs that were submitted to the form, as well as some other rare pairs I've seen floating around. I'll be listing off some rare pairs and bits from the form. Jewel X Bark, also known as Bugbear. According to the form, this started as a crack ship and became unironic. I respect that. Surge X Blaze, also known as Sir Jays. The reason for this ship seems similar to Sir Jamie, with Blaze being a trusted ally of Sonic but with the added bonus of elemental powers. Tangle X Blaze, also known as Tangaze. Tangle and Blaze have little interactions, but this pair is shipped mostly because of Tangle's first meeting with Blaze. Styx X Surge, also known as Stickurge. My understanding of the appeal of the ship is feral lesbians. Gold X Blaze, also known as Glaze. Gold the Tenrec is an obscure character from the Archie comics. As far as I'm aware, there is only one person who ships this, but honestly, go for it. Bean X Espio, also known as Bespio. Espio is more serious, while Bean is extremely cartoonish. Contrasting personalities. Jet X Silver, also known as Jet Ilver. To directly quote the form, they would both be the most insufferable freshmen at the high school, and I think it would be really funny. Honey X Amy, also known as Hanami. It's just really cute. Sonic X Mighty, also known as Sonidy. It's just really cute. Silver X Amy, also known as Sylvani. It's just really cute. Sally X Fang, also known as Sang. Started as a joke ship, then became unironic. Wave X Rouge, also known as Wave Rouge. Girl bosses. Techno X Amy, also known as Tech Amy. Techno is a character exclusive to the Fleetway comics, and she became extremely close with Amy, so naturally, they got shipped. Kit X Tails, also known as Kit Tails. Enemies slash rivals to lovers, but for Tails. Eggman X Starline, also known as Eggline. My understanding of the ship is evil, gay, and divorced. Ian Jr. X Infinite, also known as Ianfit. If you don't know who Ian Jr. is, he's essentially a canon Sonic Forces OC, and people have shipped him with Infinite. Yeah. Barry X Gadget, also known as Badget. So while this video was in development, a new rare pair popped up, this one featuring the two-player insert characters, Gadget from Forces, and Barry from the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog. Shout out to the people making content for this ship, y'all are as fast as Sonic. And now, for the moment you've all been waiting for... Probably. This is it, y'all. Probably the most well-known Sonic ship, the grand finale, the ship that was mentioned the most frequently on the forum, Sonic and Shadow, also known as Sonado. God, where do we even begin with this ship? For starters, the two embody multiple of the aforementioned dynamics. The sun and the moon, red and blue gaze, the quintessential Sonic rivals to lovers ship. Sonic is so joyous and optimistic while Shadow is more stoic and serious. The two embody so much in their dynamic. Can you tell I'm a bit biased here? I'll admit Sonato is my favorite Sonic ship, which is part of why I saved it for the end. Part of the reason why this ship is so interesting is the way it contradicts the reason as to why Sega thought a romantic partner wouldn't fit Sonic's personality. The fact that he couldn't bring himself to slow down for someone. Well, with Shadow, he wouldn't need to, because Shadow can undoubtedly keep up with Sonic. Sonic wouldn't have to slow down. In all honesty, Shadow's dynamic with Sonic is something special. They respect each other so much despite how often they disagree because they both want the same thing, to protect the planet. This desire and their differing views and philosophies creates a duo of wonderful thematic foils. They help each other out while still being a little competitive about it. I feel as though even when they become a couple, their competitiveness and silly rivalry would continue, which is one of the elements that makes this ship so fun. The two can be both wholesome and angsty. Because of everything surrounding Shadow as a character, he's a character tailor-made for angsty fanfiction. But there is also a lot of potential to explore angst from Sonic's side. I notice when it comes to Sonic angst, there are very few characters who people write Sonic expressing extreme emotion around. One of those characters is Shadow. Probably because the two have such a deep mutual respect and understanding for one another, Sonic actually talking to Shadow about his emotions feels right. The ship has evolved a lot over the years, as the dynamic between the two has grown. They may have started out as antagonistic towards each other, and occasionally they still disagree and bicker, but they have a huge undeniable amount of trust for one another, and that will never change. 
Like Sonami, Sonado is and always will be a cornerstone of Sonic shipping, but the depths of which the fandom is able to explore their relationship is essentially endless. There is a lot of room for headcanons, AUs, fanfiction, and especially fan art. It may complete sense to me as to why Sonic and Shadow became so popular. Though, even if Sonado wasn't popular, I would still ship it. Sonic and Shadow really just work well together. In conclusion, shipping can be so much fun. It's a way to explore character relationships and dynamics in a very fun and imaginative way. From fanfiction to fan art, shipping can be something very special. And to be honest, I enjoy it very much.